Good afternoon and welcome to The Angry Astronaut. At the height of the Cold War, as most of us know, Nikita Khrushchev made an infamous statement that the Soviet Union would bury the West, that the socialist method of doing things would bury the capitalist method of doing things, and the Soviet Union would be catapulted ahead in terms of their society, technology, worldwide power, and so on. Of course, this turned out to not be true, even though the Soviet Union did remain ahead of the United States, technically in many regards, especially when it came to their space program. But in the end, as we all know, after Kennedy set the objective of putting human beings on the surface of the moon by the end of the 1960s, this was something that the United States was able to accomplish, but only by means of an extremely high amount of funding and a lot of determined work on the part of some of the most talented people in the world. Fast forward to today. Now, of course, China hasn't made any sort of declarations that they are going to bury us, that they're going to beat us to the moon, anything along those lines. But once again, we do have a race to the moon going on. And like it or not, China has built an extremely robust manned space program something that we really didn't think they were capable of at all 20 years ago. And now they have their own space station that's likely to remain in service for a considerable amount of time, well after the demise of the ISS. And they are well on their way to building the necessary rockets that will put them on the surface of the moon. And they have established a goal of putting their Taikonauts on the surface of the moon by 2029 at the latest. Now, this is, of course, four years after NASA plans to do it, but given all of the budgetary overruns, given all of the delays that the Artemis program is facing, and given how convoluted the whole damn thing is, might China be ready to bury the West when it comes to their space program? And once again, if you like this content, please like, please subscribe. That's very important. And also, uh, please check those notification bell buttons and check the description for various ways to support my content. Thank you very much for watching and to making this channel a 100,000 subscriber channel some time ago now. So let's get on with the topic at hand. So here's one way to get around a flame trench. Put your rocket testing facility on the side of a mountain and test your engines that way. Of course, it's hard to say exactly what sort of impact this is having on the surrounding environment, but it doesn't really matter because China is going to test these engines by hook or by crook, and anybody that has a problem with it can either shut up or go to prison or maybe some other sort of fate. And this, of course, is one of the biggest advantages that China is going to have over Western democratic nations when it comes to our race to the moon. If they are are absolutely determined to reach their goal, and that must be accomplished to the exclusion of all other considerations, then that is what they're going to do. And this applies to private companies as well as government projects. This, by the way, is the Long Young Seven. <laughs> 
the engine being tested by a company called Space Epoch. And these, by the way, are stainless steel tanks being used for something that's similar to a reusable mini starship. This should look very familiar to all of us, of course, and it's something that China seems to be making very good progress on, although even though these are Methalox engines and there are a number of private Chinese companies trying to make a Methalox powered rocket work, thus far they have been incapable of doing this. Now, even though private Chinese companies are making some impressive progress, it is government outfits that are going to be going to the moon. This is the Long March 9, a rocket that's gone through a number of changes and evolutions over the years, and this appears to be the final version of what the Chinese are going to use to try to reach the moon. We don't have much in the way of CGI images or anything else. China remains extremely secretive about these things, another advantage of having a repressive oligarchy, but this is what we know about it right now. It's intended to be a reusable rocket, and now they intend to use 30 200-ton Methalox rocket engines, and while it has an expendable second stage using two engines of the same type. By the way, these things all have 200 tons worth of thrust, and then a third stage powered by a single 120-ton liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen stage combustion engine called the YF-91. Now, the Chinese have also included an update to this design that has the third stage powered by four less powerful liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen engines, each having 25 tons of thrust. So this appears to be in an active state of evolution. Do they have the same capability of developing on a dime the way SpaceX does? Well, the advantage, of course, that they have is the fact that nobody's going to really stand in the way of their development process process that gives them a big edge but whether or not that's a big enough edge over SpaceX's innovative process is anybody's guess. However, this rocket is capable of some pretty amazing things. We're talking about 160 tons or so to low earth orbit in a reusable configuration and 53 tons to TLI also in a reusable configuration utilizing its third stage. Now, of course, some of the demonstrations of this rocket seem to indicate that they're using solid rocket boosters as well. And if that's the case, obviously the SRBs are not going to be that easy to reuse. But at the same time, it's going to be a lot more reusable than SLS. One of the problems and the convoluted details of the Artemis program is the fact that we're making use of a totally expendable rocket, aside from Orion that is, as far as most of the mission is concerned, with reusability only being introduced with our HLS, whereas China seems to have changed and evolved their program to embrace reusability. Reusability that bears a great deal of similarity to what SpaceX is using for Starship. Now, there are some differences with the Chinese plan of putting people on the surface of the moon, most significant of which is their plan to put a separate lunar lander on the surface, not making use of a very large second stage on their reusable rocket that would require a lot of refueling. Instead, because they have a third stage, they can deploy as much as 53 tons to translunar injection and therefore a pretty large lunar lander to the surface of the moon. This is the most recent concept that was unveiled, a small reusable scout lander, not a whole lot bigger than Apollo, but nevertheless big enough to do the job, and unlike Apollo, completely reusable. So this will not allow the Chinese to deploy as much mass to the surface of the moon, obviously, as either of NASA's HLS projects, but at the same time, their rockets are definitely capable of delivering lots of cargo to the surface of the moon if they develop a separate cargo lander to deliver bases, shall we say, building materials 
materials, that sort of thing. If you're only talking about landing people, you really don't need a very large lander. And since NASA's not going with alpaca, it appears that China is the country planning to go with a small reusable scout lander. We'll see which solution proves to be the most successful. Now, currently, NASA and SpaceX still have a considerable lead. The Chinese have yet to demonstrate any sort of tangible rocket that's capable of going to low Earth orbit or any place else, whereas NASA has definitely demonstrated SLS as being a very effective and successful system, albeit ridiculously expensive and something that Congress may not continue to support, whereas China has yet to fly anything. And of course, Starship has flown as well. But that doesn't mean that NASA has an unsurpassable lead. Indeed, really, China has the leg up in many regards. Even though we like to talk about how we reached the moon first over half a century ago, so what else is new? But that really doesn't have any sort of viable meaning to today's missions. China actually are the ones who have carried out all of the successful recent landing on the moon. The United States has yet to set a single lander down on the lunar surface in over half a century. All of the engineers responsible for the success of Apollo are either long retired or dead, whereas all the Chinese engineers responsible for reaching the moon recently are obviously still very much alive. Until the Peregrine lander successfully sets down on the moon, hopefully sometime later this year, depending on the state of affairs with Vulcan Centaur, China has a massive leg up in terms of practical recent experience with setting down on the lunar surface. So maybe in some ways, China has a lead and a leg up. And by the way, the Long March 9 is not China's only reusable rocket that they have planned. The Long March 8, which has been in service for a while, although has only experienced a couple of launches, has the objective of being reusable in the long run as well. Although it doesn't have a tremendous amount of payload, its reusability is very similar to that of the Falcon 9, except for the fact that it intends to use its boosters in a reusable form format as well, landing both the core stage and the boosters on a recovery barge, very much like the Falcon 9, except with the boosters hooked on as well. A very impressive design concept. We'll have to see how all of that plays out. And then there's the Long March 10, another rocket that's part of China's overall manned expedition to the moon plan. And this rocket makes use of more old-fashioned types of engines that run off of RP-1 and liquid oxygen. It's a triple cord rocket capable of delivering 27 metric tons to translunar injection, therefore capable of delivering the lunar lander that China has planned as well. As a matter of fact, since this rocket is slated to launch in 2027, it may very well be that this is the rocket they intend to use in the short run for their manned program, eventually being being eclipsed by the Long March 9, which is far more reusable and has a greater payload. Once again, we can't be 100% certain about any of this stuff because China's space agency reveals very little about their long-term plans. But one thing is clear, China intends to build a base on the moon as rapidly as possible utilizing its in-situ resource utilization or ISRU. And this is something they intend to accomplish, at least at first, by means of a robot probe called the Chang'e 8, which should land on the lunar surface in 2027 or 2028. The Chang'e 8 mission will include robots like the one you're looking at here, and also a small lunar factory to produce ISRU lunar bricks, which they will use later on to produce lunar habitats, such as this one. ISRU materials will of course be the building blocks for all of the Chinese moon base, which will include, of course, habitats, also a nuclear reactor, a variety of exploratory rovers and other robotic probes, and also advanced communications equipment.
equipment. The nuclear reactor is the most significant part of this base, a one megawatt reactor, several times more powerful than anything NASA intends to use. A question I have asked a number of times in the past is why does China require a one megawatt reactor for a small humble research facility. It seems to me with that kind of power, China could embark on a lot more ambitious projects on the lunar surface in the future, projects that they're not talking about to the rest of the world. This could include things like lunar mass drivers designed to propel large amounts of lunar ore, for example, off the surface to where it could be gathered up and brought back to Earth, such as rare metals and other materials that China all already has a monopoly on, a monopoly that they could solidify if they reach the moon first and manage to snap up the most valuable real estate on the moon. Now, of course, international laws prohibit them from doing that sort of thing, but given China's aggressive behavior in the South China Sea and their general disregard for what everybody else regards as being international waters, it seems to me that China wouldn't have a great deal of respect for international boundaries on the moon either if they established themselves first. It's also, of course, very important to note that China's space program is exclusively a military enterprise. The first civilian Taikonaut in history is currently on the Chinese space, space station right now. The first civilian astronaut they've ever had. And given the fact that the CNSA is a military institution, then we need to regard everything that they're planning as being a future military asset. I really don't see how China is planning anything differently for their future ambitions in space. And that, above all else, is a very compelling reason as to why we need to get our shit together when it comes to Artemis. Our current plans, which involve overpriced and outdated technology and convoluted plans combining reusability and expensive expendability, is probably something that isn't going to prevail against against what we're seeing from China right now. We need to start moving forward and we need to move forward expeditiously if we don't want Artemis to be buried beneath the heel of the CNSA and the People's Republic of China. Thank you very much for watching. Please like, please subscribe, and as always, stay angry about space.